G'day guys, welcome back to the football come down for round 20. Another interesting round. A lot of curveballs thrown up. I did okay in my tipping, got six out of nine, but still like in terms of narratives for this season, things have been sh shaken up quite a little bit. Some surprise wins, Fremantle winning the Derby, who saw that coming? We'll start off with some comments from you guys generally about the round. And the first one is from Al Jolson. Thinking Collingwood were bad, and then being completely wrong because Essendon exists and Cartland not far off. Essendon was one of the bigger talking points of this round for sure for the wrong reasons. Carlton obviously got upset by the power as well. Um, I still think of the three teams there, Carlton is the most likely to be able to resurrect their season. I think for the Pies and the Dons, it's time to start thinking about next year personally. Play on footy says Bombers bombed out of finals. Demons home game felt like COVID times, more seagulls than people. Yeah, there was a very low crowd there. And Swans free OGF. I don't know, man. I don't know. I think you posted that before Sydney got absolutely rolled by the Western Bulldogs. Um, I still think Brisbane might be there. Tom Sanger says footy tipping is BS. I think I moved up a few spots in the true footy league, which means I did a little bit better than average, so I'm happy with that. Sammy the Sloth says, at this rate, the only finals game in Melbourne will be the granny. Yeah, I've seen like there are certain permutations where that's possible, like interstate teams hosting every single game of the finals. Uh, that being said, like I just did my own ladder predictor, and I had the Western Bulldogs coming fourth suddenly. Um, in that case, if they lose the first final, they host in week two. So I wouldn't bet on that. It is possible, but it really only takes one result to throw that entire thing out. So let's talk about this week's games. And it started off with a, um, a surprise result. I got this tip wrong. Carlton went down to Port Adelaide by 14 points. They started really well. They were 31 points up, I think, in the second quarter. And then, you know, one goal in the second half. In fact, Carlton actually kicked seven goals in the second quarter, and it looked like this game was going predictably. Their pressure was up, Port Adelaide's you know, ball use and every possession was rushed, and there was great defensive running, great defensive pressure from the Blues they looked on. And then suddenly at halftime, the game completely swapped, and the fact that the Power were able to arrest that momentum and hold Carlton to one goal, I think part of that was tactical as well. I mean, you really saw, obviously, Harry Mackay missed this game through illness, I believe it was. And, you know, particularly in that last quarter, the amount of intercept marks that Alira Lear was taking, it just showed that Carlton's organization going forward wasn't there. And obviously they're missing Tom DeConing as well. But a really good gutsy performance from Port Adelaide that, dare I say it, has been lacking this year. We haven't seen that level of character from Port Adelaide. It's not that they haven't been a good team. They've been, you know, good enough to be still in the mix for top four, bizarrely. But this win, I think, has been the biggest statement they've made all season. Not just the fact that they've beaten Carlton. Carlton have been a little bit patchy. But the fact they were able to rest the momentum halfway through this game and completely flip the script was very, very impressive. Interesting, I was doing a bit of a stats deep dive just to prepare for this video and you know, much has been said about West Coast and their poor pressure inside 50. Last week didn't record a single tackle inside 50. And don't get me wrong, West Coast suck. But interestingly, there has been one team worse than West Coast in the last five weeks for this stat, tackles inside 50, and that is Carlton. Very interesting. I think that really speaks to this idea that they do need a pressure small forward in that team. Got a few comments here. Darth Jeros says, Carlton are rubbish. Leo King says, when Walsh and Cripps don't fire, Carlton look average. And Daniel Singh says, Carlton may be in trouble with making the top four and even the top eight if they continue to play like this. So yeah, it has been a rough patch of form for here for Carlton. They're still sitting fourth, so they're absolutely still in the mix, but it just is so even this year that any continued lapse of form here from Carlton will potentially ruin their season. And by ruin their season, I mean miss the top four, I think, from the position they're in to really contend for the premiership this year, which is still possible. They can't really drop any more games like that. And we've got Hawthorne, I think, not this coming week, but the week after, Carlton v Hawthorne, huge game for the context of the season. It's like a mini final. As for Walsh and Cripps, that is true. Both of those guys didn't have their usual impact, or at least I think Walsh still laid like 11 tackles, but still offensively, you know, they didn't really get going. And like I said, that combined with, you know, their ability to shut down Carlton's forward line and, and be able to pick off intercept marks at the end uh, was important. But I still think Carlton can shake this off, but it was a surprise result. Let's move down to the Tasmania game. North went down to Geelong by 40 points and uh, a game that probably didn't reflect the true flow of the game, or at least the margin didn't reflect the true flow of the game, and North Melbourne played pretty well in this game. And again, continuing this run of improved form, which I think is just showing genuine progress. There hasn't been too many lapses, obviously against the Swans, they weren't great, but the difference between these two sides probably was a bit of forward line polish. It felt like North Melbourne would have several good chains, like from the back half, and use the ball well, and the final kick they just couldn't quite nail. And some of that is good defense. Obviously, Tom Stewart had an enormous impact on this game. There's a few comments about Harry Sheasel, but I went out, he had 36 disposals in this game, which I'm not sure if that's his best ever. 
but he was the first teenager to get 25 contested possessions in a game. The kid is absolutely unreal. Well, again, we'll, we'll touch on him again in the comments. Tristan Cherry as well, 53 hitouts. I know Geelong are a, a team against whom you can rack up hitouts, but Tristan Cherry's had an unbelievable season. But for the Cats, again, like I said, Tom Stewart was fantastic. We, we've come to expect that. Hasn't been the most consistent year from him, but he had a, a tremendous impact on this game, as did, as did Ollie Dempsey, who was still a genuine favorite for the Rising Star Award. Three goals, 18 possessions, seven score involvements. The Cats just do this thing where they can unearth good young talent despite not being drafted early in the draft. So we'll get to the comments, there's a number of them. Jaden Lotus says it's finally time to pull the pin and stop playing games in Hobart. Move these games to another state or simply Arden Street. I'm north through and through, but enough is enough for these Tasmanian games. I'm unsure why you feel that way. In any case, when the new Tassie team comes in, I'd imagine these these games are probably going to wind up for North. I could be wrong. G-Bag says Sheasel's having an all-time great second season and Essendon are the pretenders of the comp and won't make finals this year. So we will get to Essendon for sure, um, but agreed, agreed. As for Sheasel, there's a couple more comments. We've got he he saying he's better in his second year in the midfield than Dacos was. And Harry Sheasel Socks points out that Sheasel's the first team to get 25 contested possessions so far. The best talent in the AFL right now, it's not funny. So I just checked it on Footy Wire, comparing Nick Dacos last year to Harry Sheasel this year. Dacos has him by an extra possession, although Sheasel wins slightly more contested, only one more contested possession. But in terms of efficiency, they're very similar. Dacos has a little bit more in terms of clearances. Some of that comes down to how much time he's spending in the midfield as well. And Dacos has him for meters gain. That being said, I'm not going to make the claim necessarily that Sheasel isn't as good. I, I, think, I think he's very much of the same ilk and I'm intrigued to see the rest of his progression. Party Pasco says, despite what the scoreboard said, North should not have lost that game today. And Sheasel and Sherry are in the AA final team. Yeah, Sherry's going to be an interesting one. I've had him in my fantasy team all year and he has massively delivered. And he's been fantastic and one of the most improved players of the competition. The AA rock spot will be interesting. I think you'd have to say he's a contender. If Gorn keeps like missing football or plays injured and isn't his usual self, then I don't know where that looks at the end of the year considering Cherry has been extremely consistent. Optic Beast also agrees that Harry Sheasel makes all Australian at this point. Yes, I think, again, I need to map out my All-Australian team, but it's hard to argue against that. He's been prolific. Then we had the Q clash, and I correctly tipped Brisbane, even though I was urged not to in the comments section, because Brisbane had a number of outs, in particular Harris Andrew, and a, and a very short back line against a Gold Coast team who hasn't lost at Metricon up to this point, and has some tall power, particularly in Ben King. But it was the midfield where the Brisbane Lions got on top in this game, and ended up winning by 28 points, and I think the clearance battle was 43 to 31. We saw Hip would go back and, and grab a few intercept marks, and we also saw Ben King once again have a little bit of the yips in front of goal one, goal three. But really, the midfield is where, where this game got won and lost. And you know, Raul Anderson and Flanders are all fantastic two way defensive midfielders, but I felt like they just weren't quite on the level of someone like a Lockie Neal or a J Josh Dunkley, Hugh McCluggage, and you had Zorko outstanding in the back line. This was a danger game for the Lions, absolutely. They kind of still need to keep winning to. Ensure they get, well, oh, they could get a double chance and home finals. We'll go to the comments now. Uh, AFL Snap says Gold Coast no longer have a perfect home record. True, it took until round 20, uh, but they've got a good chance of winning their first away game next week against the West Coast Eagles. Leo King says, I need think we need to be harder on the Suns. It's been a really disappointing year. So much promise and their away record is such a joke. Again, I'm going to be reluctant to criticize their away record a week before they travel to Perth to play my boys. <laughs> Look, I think this game in isolation, they lost to what, probably the best team in the competition by five goals at the moment. So I think there's still a chance they finish higher than they've ever finished in their history. So I probably don't share the Gold Coast criticism, although I'm sure internally they'll look at things like their inability to beat teams away from home. And like the, the North Melbourne one probably stands out, even though North have been in pretty good form lately. Either way, there's still been a huge dichotomy. So there's still criticisms to be made for sure. Tiger Walker says Gold Coast season is over. I agree. I kind of thought that the case a week ago, but it's definitely true now. And Jaden Lotus says the Lions are closer to a flag than Carlton and every other team than Sydney. They should win every game for the rest of the season and a Lions see Sydney Grand Final is the best matchup from here. Please just give us an all interstate grand final. I agree. I, I think the Lions are the form team in the competition. I think you posted this before the Bulldogs rolled Sydney and... You know, you don't want to blow one result out of proportion, but obviously Sydney have lost like three of their last five now. So I think the Lions are clearly premiership favorites at the moment, but I still think Sydney Brisbane grand finals on. St Kilda versus Essendon was another interesting game. I got my tip right here. Just a gut feel that St Kilda were in better form and it kind of validated, well, they certainly validated that feeling and made me feel a little bit better about how they pantsed us last week. 
Although maybe feel a little bit worse that we lost to Essendon by five goals. <laughs> but regardless, this is, um, you know, I think I think a lot of the talk around in the media at the moment is how much Essendon have blown the great position they were in. And unfortunately, it's become a familiar tale. And I said at the start of the season, I just didn't have trust with Essendon to run out seasons. Now, I actually did sort of change my tune. And I thought, no, this Essendon side, this is the best Essendon side we've seen in a number of years and I didn't see them falling away. Now, losing to the Crows was a weird one. The Crows are just so unpredictable, and I thought that was a pretty good game, but this, this was not. And look, are they as bad as they were last year when they lost to GWS by 21 goals? They're probably not at that point yet, but there does seem to be a mental fragility to this Essendon team that they need to snuff out somehow. And as, as for solutions, I'm not sure right now. But on the other hand, St Kilda, probably too little too late at this season. Like I think for where they're at, this season's been done for a while. They just need some form to take into next year. And I think they're absolutely delivering on that. A 53 point win in this game. They've beaten Sydney recently. I think they're going to be a tough opponent for the rest of the season. I think they've really started to get their game going. And in particular, like their forward line efficiency, which has been a weakness in the past. I think they had 43 inside 50s and had 23 scoring shots. That's pretty outstanding. We saw Jack Steele kick three goals. I don't know how many times he's done that in his career, um, which is pretty outstanding. Wanganeen Miller uh, uh, continues to be an awesome player. Cooper Sharman took 10 marks. I think that was pretty much his best game at AFL level. And can I also say the candy strike jumper, maybe it's because I grew up in that era, but I think it's great. Keep that. Not permanently, but wear it more often, St. Kilda. I thought it would look really good. We'll get to the comments. Leo King says, don't want to say I told you so, but New Year, same bombers. Yeah, that kind of just echoes my thoughts as well. Um, I feel for you, Essendon fans. I really have been rooting for Essendon to make the finals this year. Morcus Morcus says, the bombers tank has run dry. We're the same old embarrassing side. I have zero hope. Beta Simp, that's a great, interesting name, says Essendon have cemented themselves as the joke of the comp again. They ain't winning a game for the rest of the season. And Jake the Muss says, I won't see an Essendon finals win in my lifetime and I'm only 19. <laughs> Those comments there read as dejected Essendon fans. And I feel for you. I really do. And look, I go for a team right now where things look very, very bleak. So uh, there's going to be no gloating here. I feel like Essendon failing to run out seasons has been a thing for so long. You know, like previous administrations, previous coaches, previous playing lists. I think back to like 2012. I think that was around the Yasada time, wasn't it? Um, but, you know, amazing first half of the season, nothing in the second half of the year. It's just... A weird Essendon thing. It's like a curse on the club. Melbourne versus GWS was an outstanding game. Now, this was at the same time of the Derby, so I didn't watch it as such, but I have caught up in it in a big way. And this was, it was an interesting game going into it. I got my tip wrong. I tipped the Ds, but I was kind of close to getting that right. And I just felt like this was a game where both teams would look at it and think, if we're serious, if we're a serious team this year, we need to win it. And ultimately, GWS come away with the chocolates and they're still bizarrely in the hunt for top four because I don't think they've been their usual selves this year. But nonetheless... Played really well. 27 points down at quarter time. That is crazy. They didn't kick 12 of the next 15 goals. Jesse Hogan outstanding again and past 50 goals for the first time in his career already. We saw Finn Callahan have 36 possessions. That was a career best. Um, you know, again, another player who could really elevate to being one of the better players in the competition. All Australian quality talent, in my opinion, as well. Um, you know, M Melbourne again, I think with Max Gorn playing a little bit underdone at the moment it is partially exposing them. And obviously they're missing Petrarca as well. And, you know, all things considered, they're playing a good team, missing some key players, absolutely. And they did, well, they kicked last three goals or something to cut the margin to two points. It's a weird game. I think their season's a bit cooked, to be honest. And I don't think finals are on the horizon. When you look at the ladder at the moment, and I will get it up here so I can see it, but Hawthorne are ninth, the Western Bulldogs are eighth. Essendon is still higher than Melbourne on the ladder. I personally think that's probably the loss that ends... Melbourne season. Diesel Power says, where did all the Melbourne fans go? Grown men were crying in the stands leading up to their premiership. Must have been a render crowd. LD Sports says, felt there were more Seagulls at the MCG than D's fans. So yeah, I looked it up and it was 16,000 people went to this game. That's the lowest attendance of any MCG game this year. That's, uh, that's kind of crazy considering Melbourne still, you know, going into this game at least. This season was still alive. And I don't think it is anymore. Archie4822 says, the Orange Tsunami is well and truly back. I hope so, because that, I predicted them to play in the grand final, and that has looked silly this year, but if they charge late and make me look good, I'll take it. Then we have the Western Derby, and uh, this game was probably a little bit better than expected. Uh, West Coast, both teams applying massive amounts of pressure in the first half, 
And, uh, you know, the Eagles got three goals in front, at least I think late in the second quarter. I didn't fully have my hopes up that we would pull off a crazy upset. And uh, sure enough, you know, towards the end of the second quarter and then throughout the third, Fremantle just went into fifth gear and uh, they played some outstanding footy. And Josh Tracy in particular was outstanding and, and could have been a worthy nomination for the medal. I think Brayshaw and Sarong were probably just as good, but Tracy was fantastic. And uh, it sucks losing a derby, but uh, I have to give credit where it's due. Fremantle are a good team and I am pleased to say to some extent, West Coast challenge them. I've done a whole review from an Eagles perspective on the True Eagle YouTube channel if anyone wants to see that. So we'll go straight to the comments. Frio Better says, Flag Mantle. I think Fremantle is a contender this year. I probably didn't learn that from this week, although it was a mature performance. I wouldn't you know, necessarily mark against them that West Coast got closer than expected because I think West Coast have this ability to play well for a bit. And uh, they chose this week. Zelma Zam says, My wife was walking past when watching the Derby and said that number nine on the Eagles has anger issues. Funniest thing I'd heard all day. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for anyone who didn't see it, there was a lot of fire and spice in this Derby. And, um, you know, Drewsy assures me that happens every time. I don't think it does. I think this one was a particularly fiery one. And Harley Reid in particular was getting into a few Frio players and getting it back. And it was a very tense atmosphere. I think that is funny. I, I don't think it's an anger thing. I think he's just, you know, loves a bit of the biff. And you look, if he's not giving away free kicks in front of goal, I'm fine with it. He did that once in this game and, and it annoyed me. Dean Basil, I'm so sorry. I always trip up on your name. Schofield has already brought a more of an edge from the Eagles that's been missing for the last few years. It still needs the older players because the younger players have been developed in an environment that seems too soft. Onwards and upwards. I hope so. I mean, we've had three games under Schofield. We've had two honorable losses and one horrendous loss against St. Kilda where we played really poorly. And I think that is kind of continuing the theme of what it was like under Simo. So uh, I'm not quite there yet, although I do hope that Schofield is a, you know, a genuine contender to take over. I think he's pretty good. He, he says Jack Williams could be some player in the near future. Jack Williams is, has impressed me a lot as a young key forward who is now taking strong marks and impacting and being composed and not making mistakes. I really hope, I hope you're right. I feel very confident that he's going to be an AFL quality player now. Shane Trebasta says, why can't West Coast bring that fire every week instead of only in their grand final for the year of the Derby? Freer fan here, and they had me very nervous first half. Completely different team to what rolls out most weeks. This is true, and um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's hard to explain what happened in that first Derby. It was a combination of us, you know, clicking and, you know, playing an impressive contested brand against Freo in the first Derby, and then also probably getting Freo at a good time after a couple of close Adelaide games. And this time, I, I think Fremantle came better prepared. It wasn't a tactical thing that we were able to get on top of Fremantle in the first half. It was sheer willpower, but I don't think that was sustainable. And ultimately, that's what cost us. But again, like you sort of touched on there, it's disappointing that we do this sometimes, but not nearly enough. We got no comments on the Sunday game, so we'll move through them pretty quickly. We got Collingwood who beat Richmond by 26 points. Again, I don't know how much to take away from this. There's a couple of individuals. You know, I still think Collingwood are probably up on the ropes and not really a realistic finals chance. But, you know, got to give credit to Nick Dacos. So this is his first quarter, for anyone who didn't see it. 18 disposals, 10 contested possessions, 7 score involvements. 7. If you do that every quarter, you end up with 28. That's absurd. And 5 clearances. Unbelievably outstanding game. And I think a lot of those Sheasel comments... You know, probably came before this game. And I realize that Dacos is a year older, but like, I think we just have two insane talents in the league right now. He ended up with 42, 18 contested, 12 score involvements, 12 clearances. Like, this guy can seriously win the Brownlow this year. Other than that, we saw McStay, you know, in his second game back, kick three goals. I think that's, um, you know, something that the Pies have missed. Although, you know, him coming back into the team at this point of the season, it's probably just about him rebuilding confidence in his body because I don't think there's going to be finals to play for. As for the Tigers, you know, again, another honorable loss. And, you know, Tom Brown kicking three goals was nice. I think those were the first three goals he's kicked of his career. I still like what I see of guys like, um, you know, Steely Green. There's a bit to work with there for Richmond, but I think at this point they're going to be looking at this year's draft and trying to replenish their list. And, and for years they've missed out on the draft. So they're going to go full rebuild. At the end of the day, this was another honorable loss, I guess. Sydney versus the Western Bulldogs was a stunning result. Um, look, I I did see the potential for a Bulldog win because of the form that they've been in. And, and equally, on the other hand, Sydney have not been in great form. I would not have predicted it go quite the way 
this game ended up being. I think it was, ended up being 39 points, but I think it was threatening to be way more than that at one point. But it was not even just the fact that the Bulldogs have a tall forward line and Sydney, you know, with a couple of injuries as well, bear that in mind. Um, you know, they have an undersized defense. It wasn't even that. It was just pure pressure that the Bulldogs were able to apply. And when we've seen the Bulldogs play this well, it's often come at the back of some intense pressure. And, and I do remember when the Eagles played the Bulldogs this year, I was very impressed by the level of pressure the Bulldogs were able to apply and Sydney were very vulnerable. The tall forwards did have an impact, but I think it was a product of what was happening up the field. So what do we have? We had Hugo Hagen kicking four goals, 10 marks for Norton, Sandars also got a goal. But like I said, it was further up the field what was happening in True Law, 40 disposals, seven score involvements, keeping his name in the mix for all Australian. I don't know if he'll make it because it's very competitive. But contested possessions was a walloping in this game, 162 to 135. Anything over 20 is pretty much a walloping. I did look up the stats. Sydney are bottom three in the league for clearances in the last five games, and they're bottom four for contested ball. So that has got to be something they need to rectify come this final series. I, I think that they will. We got a comment here from Papley lives fr- uh, rent free in your head, says Swans may be going to get 2016 again. The eight is so close, it's insane. I think the best version of Sydney is at least up there with Brisbane as the top two teams of the competition. I don't think it's a bad thing they're, they're going through a form slump at the moment. Like looking back historically, teams that start well usually have a slump before finals. So I'm not concerned yet unless Sydney bring this form into finals. And finally, we had Adelaide and Hawthorne. And my God, this is a weird game. Well. Hawthorne smoked them. And we just have to take Hawthorne seriously now. I, I feel like I have been. But, you know, I, I, it's weird that they still sit outside the eight. This is a bizarre season. It's been unreal from them. And I, I think there's no doubt... Not because of necessarily that Adelaide's a strong opponent. Beating them in Adelaide convincingly is impressive regardless of their form, but it's just that this form has just continued for Hawthorne. They've had one bad game in the last, I don't know, 10, 11. Um, You know, the Crows led a quarter time of this game and then Hawthorne kicked 13 unanswered goals. Will Day, an outstanding player. Connor McDonald, two goals and 28 possessions. And, you know, we've got another finals-like game next week. The Giants are hosting Hawthorne at Marnica Stadium. And I don't know who to tip in that game. I think I'm going to go Hawthorne. Like, their form is so compelling. It's just so hard to tip against them. But I hope we see Hawthorne in the final series. I hope somehow both them and the Western Bulldogs make it. I don't know how that's going to be possible. One's eighth and one's ninth, so you need a team from above to fall out. But I would actually be disappointed if Hawthorne don't make the finals this year. Where to now for the Crows? This has been such an up and down season, and it's been more down than up, that's for sure. But their best form has been good. Um, you know, I expected them to go a little bit closer at home against Hawthorne, but, you know, Hawthorne have been damn good this year, so it's hard to hard to know what to make of it. Overall, though, the Crows will be in a, they're in a bitterly disappointing part of their, if you want to call it the rebuild. I mean, I thought that kind of ended last year. But I'll be very interested to see, like, where to now? What do they do with their lists? You know, I've seen that they, they're really keen on Sid Draper in the draft this year. I've also seen that their first pick is up for grabs for a trade this year. So it's an interesting offseason for the Crows, and I'll, I'll be intrigued to see what they do with their list this offseason. A number of teams now, Essendon's one of them, Collingwood's another. We're all starting to think about, you know, what what do we do with our list at the end of the year? That's the phase of the season that a lot of us have moved into, and I say us because West Coast were there in round four. <laughs> Anyway, guys, thank you for your contributions to yet another football come down. Make sure you let me know in the comments any other thoughts you have on this round. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.